uh, the original idea was, uh, um, I used to work, and when I did my postdoc at University of North Carolina, uh, when I did the postdoc there, I worked with a bunch of uh, researchers uh, that were great at doing really complicated experiments, and they could generate measurements and data and whatnot. Uh, but I was the numbers guy, and so they would, you know, at the end of the day, they'd give me their data, and they'd say, work your magic. And um, I mean, I didn't, I had no problem doing statistics. I love doing statistics, but I, I didn't want what I did to seem like magic. Um, and so I created these little, uh, I called them stat chats at the time. And they were these little presentations I would give for the lab once a month, um, sort of just trying to explain what I was doing so that uh, it wouldn't seem like magic. And um, uh, 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 it was, I worked in a big lab and there were people constantly coming and going. So what I decided I would do is I would start recording these stat chats and put them on YouTube. And the, and the idea wasn't that the, that people all over the world, it wasn't that people in Pakistan would be watching my videos. <laughs> the idea was uh, it was just people and like when a new person came in the lab and they wanted to learn about p-values, they could just watch the p-value video or they wanted to learn about box plots. They could just watch the box plot video. And I wouldn't have to repeat that seminar once every three months or whatever. Um, and so it's just sort of like kind of random luck that the videos themselves caught on. I, uh, I, I feel very kind of blessed in that respect that it, it was um, that I, 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 you know, I was just having some fun and I just thought I'd make a little resource available for the lab. And now it's it turned out that lots of people were interested in this resource. Um, and so that's kind of the how StatQuest got started, and here we are now. Yeah. Um, you briefly mentioned your work uh, in Jamaica at the Remote Science Hall. So um, if you could just um, shed some light on that. Yeah, so one of my coworkers, uh, one of the researchers is Jamaican and uh, was very, uh, wanted to, there's not a lot of, there is relatively little research going, scientific research going on in Jamaica. It's a very, is the economy in Jamaica is ba largely based on tourism and, you know, people come in on big cruise ships and sit on the beach. Um, but they wanted to promote science as a, as a career path, as something that, that you could do and you could do it even in Jamaica. And, um, and so I went to Jamaica and I, I, I've gone twice now to give seminars on how to get started in data science and how to get started in bioinformatics. Um, and it's, I think it's, I mean, it's one of the things I feel like is really great about uh, computing and data science is that it's a, it's, a, it's a field that you can do pretty much with relatively little resources. Um, whereas when you do an experiments in a laboratory, you need all kinds of fancy equipment and expensive stuff. Um, but a lot of data science can be done on a pretty basic computer using a lot of free resources like i do a lot of stuff in the r programming language and that's free um and a lot of the the tools that you can use in r are all free and and it's almost something anyone in the world could do at any time with a very minimal uh investment in kind of resources and so i i thought it was a great opportunity and so i did it and that's actually that that first time I went to Jamaica was a big turning point in Jam in StatQuest because before I went to Jamaica, StatQuest was all stats all the time, all statistics. Uh, but I went to Jamaica and someone there said, "Could you tell us about random forests?" And I said, "I have no idea what a random forest is. That sounds crazy, but I'll look into it." And I did some research, and about a couple months later, I created my first video on decision trees and then i eventually made it to random forest and now i've got a whole i say at least half of my videos are dedicated to machine learning topics and random forest is one of the machine learn topic learning topics and that's kind of what how it all got started was my trip to jamaica and talking with people there and they said well this is what we want to learn about so um since they wanted to learn about random forests i i taught about random forests I think one of the um, most um, important factors in um, your success on YouTube and in general is that um, what I personally feel 
is a factor is um, how you actually make it relatable to normal people. For example, uh, we know um, that it's relatively easier to do um, natural sciences research where you actually have quantitative variables. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, in social sciences, it's very hard to actually quantify the um, observation, for example, in um, sociology and psychology, which we could um, gain um, factual, um, incontroversial inferences from. Um, and you mentioned free software that we use these days. I mean, I do workshops for my students um, in which I teach them SPSS um, and um, regression and um, logistic regression and things like this, even on Excel and things like this. And what I've noticed sure. that is the sheer power of uh, these free tools like R um, and um, other programming languages like Python, um, they add a lot to the research that we are doing uh, today. Um, I don't think Pakistan is very different uh, from Jamaica in terms of um, scientific contributions um, and regional research, but you as someone who has seen the whole spectrum, both from uh, the software development side and also the academic side of it, and who have published in um, the best magazine around the world for science, what do you recommend uh, for a scientist in training or um, a scientist in the future um, to use these tools for and actually make sense out of that. Because that's that has been a repeating theme in my um, statistical workshops, that it's one thing and to come up with results, um, the data analysis, but then how to actually interpret them, which I guess is the reason why you got a lot of uh, popularity among your um, peers. Um, so what do you yeah. suggest for a new scientist to, um, how to approach this problem? Uh, I mean, I, yeah, interpreting results is, I mean, is, is key. And I, uh, for me, interpreting results, that, that understanding how to interpret the results comes from understanding the method itself. Uh, and that's what, you know, that's the big thing of StatQuest is, is we try to approach uh, a problem where we start with data and we go, hey, we collected this data. What can we do with it? Uh, can we do a linear regression? Can we do some other sort of analysis? And what will those do for us? What's the point of that? And then we go through the, the algorithm, what, what those things are doing. And, and as we go through it, you develop an intuition as to how to interpret the output, what the results mean. Um, I, think it's, I think it's critical. I also feel like um, a big thing in data science and data analysis isn't just being able to correctly interpret the results, but also to correctly communicate the results. Um, and that can be, and that's a, that's a kind of a subtle thing because sometimes I, I'll talk to other statisticians or other bioinformaticians and we can all speak in a really high level language and we can use all kinds of nomenclature. Uh, but oftentimes I'm teaching, I'm talking, not teaching, I'm talking with people that are from various fields, um, all kinds of fields. Um, you know, I've worked, I just recently worked with someone in public health. Uh, I've worked with people in archeology, span uh, pretty much every field possible. And, and being able to communicate in a way that they can understand without using too much jargon without um, you know, being, you know, being able to communicate in a way that they can relate to, I think is a very critical skill for anyone who's interested in data science and interpreting data and dealing with data because you never know who you're gonna have to talk to about the results and explain the results to. And everyone has different backgrounds and different educations and it's, it's key, it's very important to try to find a middle ground where you can where you can uh, communicate effectively between you. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key points that you touched upon, um, and I'm glad you brought it up, um, is the fact that you know a data scientist um, is a, able to transfer um, his knowledge and apply to different domains, like you're working in archaeology and um, epidemiology and um, things like this, where the, in these fields, um, learning actually data analysis actually helps in determining the biomarkers and factors that would um, help in finding the new drugs um, and, and doing yeah. the split testing for that. So th these are very crucial skills. And now we also are taking it to a new level where we apply machine learning concept like neural network 
um, and different confusion metrics uh, resulting from uh, different analysis to find which is the most optimal way of doing things. And we have yep. wonderful things like uh, facial recognition and touch sensors and things like this. Uh, one of the things that we academics are notorious for is that, you know, we do the analysis for the sake of analysis and overcomplicate it to get published <laughs> and things like that. So uh, the, uh, I mean, statistics, like you said, in putting in your words, statistics um, is catching up with machine learning very fast um, because machine learning has become the de facto center for the corporate world where they're actually yeah. uh, fixing and the real world pressing issues in our, of our times. What do you suggest that academics, because I'm asking you because you have seen, you know, both ends of the spectrum. So what do you suggest? Um, and I guess in, from a youth perspective, it's probably, um, you know, it, it's a no brainer, but for the rest of the world where science has not evolved to a point where there is a significant streamlining between academia and industry, what do you suggest that academics uh, should do or the institution should do to make sure that their research is actually applicable um, not only to the industry but also to the normal people um, like you are doing to make it yeah. more understandable to make it more accessible for uh, ordinary people because unless you have a consumer that understands your product um, it yeah. can be a good intellectual exercise yeah. but it certainly isn't going to be very helpful yeah i mean i mean i i i, I feel that pain as well, I, it's very painful for me to, like when I was at UNC, I mean, I, I love the place and it was a great institution, but it was still painful to go to talks and just see people only be able to communicate with their peers. You know, these are top level genetics researchers that can only communicate their, what they're doing, why they're doing it with their peers. And that always kind of drove me crazy because we're not doing it for the peers. I mean, at least here, the research is publicly funded. We're, we're doing it for everyone. We're doing it for the, all the, all, you know, the whole public. And if we can't communicate that to the whole public, why should the public care is a question I have. And I think that's a reasonable question. I think, I think like I said, I, I can't stop talking about how important I think communication is. Um, and so, I mean, I, I feel like a good way to um, a good way to practice and make sure you're grounded and people. And this is kind of like the, the joke is like always, always try to explain what you're doing to your grandmother. Um, <laughs> That's a good and, one. And if she can get it, then you're probably doing a pretty good job. Um, I mean, she loves you or whatever. She, you, she'll be she'll like whatever you say. But. But if you can get her to understand what you're working on, you can get her to understand some statistics or some experiment that you're doing, why you're doing it. If you can do that, you could probably convince anybody else. And I, I, I've always firmly believed in that, um, that approach, that it's, the, the knowledge is useless unless I can communicate it. Um, and so that's, that's one way to try, yeah. Yeah, yep, fair enough. I think, um, the change at institutional level is probably harder to make also. Um, and, yeah. But we can always, you know, try to able to communicate um, normal people where they're, what research or tax money is funding actually. And also, you know, it, it's a good thing that people would um, understand. But, you know, let's um, go a little bit deeper into that and talk about uh, the granular level of the individual because that's where the most responsibility lies. Um, I think yeah. you did your part, I'm doing my part, but um, there's unfortunately a very negative trend. I'm pretty sure that's um, around the globe and it's not uh, limited to Pakistan also, uh, which is that um, people in, in graduate studies and in postgraduate studies, they tend to do a lot of work um, to get published. And sometimes yeah. uh, they do um, research work that's not their own and they're not passionate about that. It's more about what their supervisor yeah. wants and uh, to be part of a good lab and have some yeah. prestige and, you know, resulting a career out of that. Um, and I, in my personal experience, um, haven't found that to be a very good long-term strategy for yeah. happiness. That's terrible. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And so we have got a very, yeah. probably we have the highest uh, stress um, representation in uh, PhD as students. Yeah. And so what do you suggest that, you know, how do we align our passion with our 
work and also make sure that it's um, beneficial for the world. Um, in, yeah, that's, in that's the, because you've been the one um, yeah. who's actually, you know, uh, been able to accomplish that. I've been very, very lucky. Um, uh, however, I've always, uh, I've always had really good mentors. I mean, that's part of the fortune in my life. My, my last boss, the one that encouraged me to quit my last job so that I could do StatQuest, he used to always tell me uh, that you needed to find the most important thing you could be doing and do that thing. And I don't know, no one had ever put it that way. I, I've always, you know, there's always been a, things I can do. I'm a, I'm a pretty good computer programmer. I could get a job programming. Um, I'm a pretty good statistician. I could get a job doing statistics. Um, but I discovered that the most important thing I could be doing with my time is teaching statistics and teaching machine learning. That's what I discovered about myself. Um, and it's, and it wasn't obvious from the get go. Uh, and it, and part of the reason why it wasn't obvious is I was doing those other things. I was do I was programming for other people and I was doing statistics for other people. But over time, especially through the channel, I discovered that, Although I'm good at programming, good at statistics, my real talent is in teaching statistics and teaching machine learning. And if, and if I, if I, I only, we only have so much time on this world to do what we can do. And I felt like the most important thing I could be doing with that limited amount of time is dedicating it to teaching statistics. And I, and I'm not saying everyone needs to teach statistics, but I am think, I am think, saying that whatever you're doing uh you're in a phd you're in a master's program you're in a normal job at a, in an industry or wherever you are think about it what is the most important thing you could be doing with the small amount of time you have on this planet what's how are you going to help the most people w what can you do um to bring the most benefit to the world and when you think about it in that terms, it's it, uh, uh, things start making, you start being able to prioritize things in a different way. So that's my advice. It's a very good one, actually. You know, we yeah. really need this um, in these times where um, somehow it's become a um, goal that other people promote uh, for us and not something that we always want to do in life. Yeah. Yeah, I th especially I feel like in, in grad school, a lot of people, or at least in the, in the United States, a lot of people go to grad school right after college. They go to college and they don't go, they don't get a job. They go straight to grad school and they do it just because they've been in school their whole lives. They don't really know what they want specifically. Why are they there? Sure, to get a degree, to get a PhD, you get some respect from that. And that's great. But why are you really there? Are you yeah. there that, so that you can accomplish something, so you can build a skill so that you can a, achieve the most important thing you could be doing with your time? These are really tough questions. And you need to be able to, you know, you need to figure out a way that you can answer those. And at least in the US, it's, you know, a lot of people go straight through without really asking those questions. And that's, that's it's not such a good thing. Well, unfortunately, I don't think, you know, um, the scenario is very different uh, here also. I mean, I certainly understand, you know, if you put in a lot of work um, in your life uh, in a field, you know, you probably are expecting a little bit of prestige out of that. And I guess this is how a society's way of rewarding people. Um, but then that shouldn't be the only purpose of your life. Um, this is what I and keep telling my students also. Um, but let's uh, get to the uh, fun part of your um, teaching, which is your use of BAM and double BAM. Where did that come from? You know, I, I have no idea. Uh, I just started saying BAM uh, a lot during these little presentations I would give the lab because I because I was like, hey, statistics is exciting. And they'd be like, no way. And I'd say, but look, BAM. And they'd go, oh, well, if you say BAM, maybe that makes it more exciting. Um, and <laughs> I started saying BAM a lot. And then I was like, well, well, where do I go from here? Cause this is even more exciting. And sort of as a joke, I just said double BAM cause I thought that was completely ridiculous, but everybody laughed, uh, I guess cause they, it was completely ridiculous, but everyone laughed and it was fun. 
And um, now we've established the BAM, double BAM, triple BAM hierarchy of awesomeness. <laughs> and you, you start off, you know, doing cool stuff and that's a BAM. But when you crank it up just a little bit more and it's just a little bit more awesome, double BAM. But when you take it all the way and you just can't get any more awesome than that, and you're at the top, that's triple BAM. So, uh, so <laughs> that's also, where the... And we also have terminology alert and shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 I hate... I hate jargon. I hate sort of like area specific jargon because I have a terrible memory and I'm, I have a tough and tough, tough enough time communicating as it is without all these extra special words. So whenever I have a, uh, there's some, some new jargon I have to teach. There's a terminology alert and that's kind of for me because I have to remember that, oh yeah, people use these terms. Uh, but yeah, I also do shameless self promotions because, you know, I, people are here to learn cool stuff. And I don't, I feel like it's a little weird for me to advertise that, Hey, if you, if you like this, you might also like my other video. 